Now, let's make no mistake, although there's much we can learn from good pedagogy and best practices, developing spiritual leaders is a spiritual undertaking. There's a spiritual dynamic in developing leaders. If we look at the way Jesus was involved in developing people, one of the things we see is that in Matthew 9, he's, he's ministering and people are just lining up to come and have Jesus pray for them to heal them to help them. And he looks at them, saying his, his heart is broken, he's moved with compassion because he says they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he turns to the disciples and says, pray that the Lord of the harvest raises up more workers, because the harvest is ready. The workers are few. Now, if you look at your church and you say, oh, we don't have enough workers, you're in good company. Jesus didn't have enough workers, okay? Now, Jesus could, Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus could have just waved his hand, performed a miracle, and healed everybody. Okay, let's just take care of this in one shot, right? Miracle, big miracle, everybody's healed, go home, and I'll get a nice rest, right? Jesus could have done that. He didn't do that. He expected his disciples to be a part of the answer. But he said the first thing is to pray, to pray that the Lord raises up those workers. Don't complain that we don't have enough workers. Pray that God raises up more workers. Now, of course, then the very next verse is he turns to the disciples and sends them out to do ministry. So they were a part of the answer to their own prayers. But prayer is going to be a starting point that we pray for more workers. We select workers prayerfully. Again, let's just learn a little bit from the example of Jesus here in Luke chapter 6. And uh, we read here in Luke 6, 12 and 13, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them who he designated apostles. And so even though Jesus had a number of followers at that point, he spends a whole night in prayer before he selects the 12 who are going to be the most important key leaders in his movement. And so once again, we not only pray that God raises up workers, but we pray that God will give us insight into which workers are the ones we should invest in. See, Jesus, there's no way Jesus could have given everybody the same treatment. Now, this is one of the things that sometimes arises in church ministry. If a pastor or the church planter says, I want to focus in on training uh, just a few key leaders who will then be uh, multipliers and key people in the church. Sometimes people in the church say, wait a minute, pastor, you, you're spending time with certain people and not with me. And why are they special and I'm not special? And some people say, well, the pastor should spend time with everybody and everybody should, should be treated equally. Ah, I understand that, but it's not what Jesus did either. He had a large masses then there were the 70, then there were the 12, and then there were Peter, James, and John, sort of the inner circle that he had very exclusive special times with. So Jesus was selective. He ministered to the masses, but he especially invested himself in a smaller number. And we have to be willing to do this. And we have to help our churches understand that this is a spiritual principle, that we invest in those who are faithful people and who will be the ones that God has chosen to be future leaders. And so then we identify those who are faithful, gifted, and teachable persons. So 2 Timothy 2.2 is a scripture that speaks to this. Or Paul writes to Timothy, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses... Entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So you see several generations here. The things you've heard from Paul in the presence of many witnesses. Paul has taught Timothy. He tells Timothy to entrust that to reliable men who will teach others also. You've got really four generations. Paul, Timothy, reliable men, and others. And the key here is 
that reliable person, that trustworthy person who's able. So able is a gifted person. Reliable, trustworthy is the other feature. And teachable. Sometimes people are reliable, they're gifted, but they're not teachable. They're not willing to be guided. They're not willing to be taught. They think they already know how to do everything. And that is not going to be a person who you're probably going to be able to help and invest in very well. And so these are three features I look for when I'm thinking about who do we want to invest our time with selectively in developing them in their service and in their leadership. Now sometimes we tend to gravitate to people who are well educated. We tend to gravitate to people who are successful in their business or other aspects of life. That's pretty normal. But those are not necessarily the standards that the scripture sets. And so we want to be looking for these kind of people. And I've noticed in, in my church plans, sometimes they're, they're a new believer. They're not very far along in their faith even, but you see that potential there. You see them making the kind of right decisions early in their walk with Christ. You see them being committed. You see them being teachable. Remember what we said the other day, they're being faithful in the small things. And maybe that new believer is not ready to lead a Bible study or preach, but they're just willing to come and set the chairs up. And they're there every time. And, they, and they're faithful in doing the small things. And gradually you begin to say, that's a person who has potential. You look for their giftedness. Now I think of one person in one of our churches, very faithful, very gifted in many ways, very teachable, but he just didn't really have the gift to teach. And uh, so I could help him develop his life in many ways and he became a leader, but he just really wasn't going to be a teacher. He felt very uncomfortable in that role. And that's okay. It just wasn't his gift. It would have been awkward and inappropriate to sort of try and force a person in that direction. So these are the things you look for. Faithful, gifted, teachable. And then we pray for the growth of those workers. In other words, it's not just about techniques of teaching and, and uh, how to uh, practically sort of have a program to develop them, but we continue to pray for them. And here again, I've just listed a few of Paul's prayers that uh, it's so important to be continually praying for the growth of these people. Remember, Jesus prayed for Peter. He said, Satan's going to sift you. Um, and so we continue to pray, and we have these beautiful prayers of Paul for the churches. And we can just take those prayers, and we can just pray them for not only for our church, but especially for spiritual leaders. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. And then let's remember, we actually want to develop servant leaders. In fact, the very title, leadership development, can be a little bit dangerous. I like to talk actually more about servant development. Now, servant leadership uh, is described in, by Jesus in uh, this passage in Matthew 20. So let me read Matthew chapter 20, verse 24 uh, to 28. Um, when the ten heard this, they were indignant at the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here we have the classic definition of servant leadership. It's not about me exercising authority of controlling people. It's about me empowering other people. Now, again, we've said there's very different understandings of what good leadership looks like in different cultures. Some have a stronger sense of authority, some a lesser sense. And I don't think this means that 
a servant leader is the person who is the person who's always doing the menial tasks and um, you know never somehow exercises spiritual authority. But the reason why we exercise any authority that we do have is for the betterment of other people and for the empowerment of other people. That's going to be the key. That means I'm serving. Their best interest is in mine, not me being somehow the important person with the power. And that's, again, very consistent with the idea of giving ministry away, of not controlling it. Supervising, guiding, yes. But not controlling and not making myself the most important person. 